Most of us know someone who's been affected by cancer in our lives. Uh, cancer can be a very devastating diagnosis, but the good news is for most cancers, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of research and new medications and treatments that are helping to make a difference. Today, we're gonna talk about cancer care in general for all types of cancers. And in order for you to capture the most important aspects of this topic, there's a special unique exemplar worksheet just for this video. So make sure that as you follow along that you're filling out the unique exemplar worksheet that relates to this video. So let's go ahead and get into this topic of cancer care right now. So cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. The good news is cancer deaths have actually decreased 27% from 2001 to 2020. So while cancer is still a leading cause of death, the treatments for cancer are improving each year. Cancer uh, rates and prevalence are expected to increase over time. In fact, the CDC says that they anticipate a 47, 49% increase in cancer prevalence, meaning cases, from 2015 until 2050. So we're only gonna see more and more cancer uh, patients coming into our clinics. The most common types of cancers include lung cancer, breast cancer, colorectal, prostate, skin, and stomach. Now, there are a lot of carcinogens in the environment, which is why we're seeing more and more increase in cancer. Things like pesticides in our uh, foods and our, that are being sprayed on the fields, alcohol, tobacco, ultraviolet rays from sun exposure, um, asbestos uh, can all um, increase our risk for, um, for cancer. Oftentimes there is a genetic component to cancer plus some kind of um, carcinogen trigger from the environment. Um, but the way cancer works is um, our bodies are constantly making new cells. That's how we live. We make new cells to regenerate the old ones, right? And so that we continue to have new cells for our body. And typically our cells are really good about if they are made with a mutation, they wave a little flag saying, I'm mutated, I'm no good, go ahead and just kill me. And then the phagocytes will come over and kill that mutated cell. And that's how we maintain having healthy re replication of cells and not mutations. But cancer cells are sneaky. Cancer cells are mutated cells, but instead of waving a little flag that says, I'm mutated, please come kill me, they hide that flag and then they go ahead and replicate themselves. And with each replication, they usually get a little bit more mutated. Um, and that's how cancer happens. We get these rogue cells that are mutated that replicate in the body. There are a number of risk factors for cancer. These include exposure to carcinogens, um, the environment itself, lifestyle, hormones. Some cancers are like estrogen based. Um, having some kind of infectious disease. For example, cervical cancer, the number one cause of cervical cancer is the HPV virus. Certain medications can cause cancer. Um, having a poor immune system can cause cancer because the immune system isn't able to find and kill off any mutated cells. And then certainly nutrition can play into this as well. Patients who have a diet that's higher in fruits and vegetables, higher in antioxidants, that reduces the risk for cancer. Patients who have a diet high in dairy or processed meats increases the risk for cancer. Cancers are staged using TNM, T for tumor size, N for node involvement, and M for metastasis. So T for tumor size, so the bigger this tumor, the bigger the number. Node involvement means has this cancer spread to the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are these little um, areas throughout the lymph system um, where there's like filters and can collect and filter out lymph. Um, but if cancer spreads into the lymph system, it can basically go anywhere in the body. And so the first sign of that would be node involvement close to where the tumor was. And then the last step is has it metastasized? Has that cancer spread from the original place and now taken up residency elsewhere? For example, you have a patient with breast cancer and they may have a very small cancer that has no lymph node involvement and is just in one breast. 
that's a very small uh, tumor, right? Um, the next step of that might be that the lymph nodes near the um, tumor have have cancer cells in them. That's node involvement. And then the last step would be that not only are we seeing this breast cancer, but now they are starting to have a tumor grow like in their lungs or in their bladder. And that's metastasis, where that original tumor has now spread to another area of the body. So certainly the larger the tumor, the more lymph node involvement and any metastasis increases the severity of the cancer. This graphic here um, and description talks about the metastasis and the cells of, of cancer cell metastasis. So stage zero means that the cancer is only local and really no nearby tissue and it's very curable and removable with surgery. Stage one is just slightly more invasive um, stage two and stage three are deeper invasive into the tissue and have spread to the lymph system. And then stage four is when it's not only spread to the lymph system, but now it is metastasized to other areas of the body. Cancers can be characterized by either being a solid tumor malignancy or a hematologic malignancy. Solid tumors would be things like breast cancer, prostate cancer, liver cancer, colorectal cancer, where there's a mass of tumor cells. And hematologic cancers are blood-based cancers like leukemia. The CAUTION acronym helps us to remember and identify early signs and symptoms of cancers in general. So C stands for any changes in bowel or bladder habits. A is a sore or wound that just won't heal. U is any unusual bleeding or discharge. Uh, T is a thickening of or, or lump in the breast or any other place in the body. I stands for indigestion or difficulty swallowing if there is some sort of esophageal cancer, mouth cancer, gastric cancer, um, colorectal cancer, some kind of GI cancer. Um, o for any obvious change in a wart or a mole that could indicate skin cancer. And N for a nagging cough or hoarseness that could indicate um, anything involving the airway or areas around the airway like thyroid cancer, um, lung cancer, esophageal cancer, and so on. In addition to using the um, CAUTION acronym, you can also look for these constitutional signs. Constitutional signs are vague symptoms um, of just someone being unwell. Unexplained fatigue or weight loss, a fever that you can't pin down to any reason, a fever of unknown origin, um, and night sweats, all vague symptoms of cancer. Um, other malignancy specific signs and symptoms are going to be dependent on where that tumor is. So if the patient is having a lung cancer, they may be shortness, have shortness of breath. If they have bone cancer, they may have pain like in their leg or in their back, wherever that tumor is. Um, if they have a brain tumor, they may experience headaches or seizures. And if they have bladder cancer, they may have a urinary obstruction be uh, and retention because urine is not passing past the tumor. Prevention is the name of the game when it comes to cancer. It is a lot easier to prevent cancer than it is to treat it once it happens. And every patient should be aware of ways that they can prevent uh, their risk factors for cancer. So it's about risk factor modification, avoiding things like tanning beds and putting on sunscreen before you go outside, trying to eat organic produce to reduce the amount of exposure to uh, pesticides in our food, reducing uh, consumption of processed meats and dairy, increasing fruits and vegetables, um, staying up on immunizations as some immunizations can prevent types of cancers. Uh, the secondary prevention is screening. So if we can't prevent cancer, we want to identify it early because it's a lot easier to treat when it's small and hasn't metastasized or had lymph node involvement. So um, there are a number of screenings that the American Cancer Society and the CDC recommend. Uh, breast cancer, uh, uh, women or females should be uh, screening monthly for monthly self-exams starting at puberty. Uh, females should have an annual mam mammogram starting at age 45, um, which is a non-invasive um, procedure, kind of like an x-ray um, uh, where they go in annually for that. And uh, they should have a biannual mammogram starting at age 55. And that's because um, breast cancers are often estrogen based. And so as women go or as females go through menopause, uh, they may not have the, as high of a risk for breast cancer. Males need to start doing monthly testicular self-exams starting at puberty, and pretty much age 50, 15 to 55 is when testicular cancer is the highest risk. 
Um, and so this is something that's done, done um, at home monthly and as well as at their annual physical. Prostate cancer. Um, a PSA level can be drawn to, um, to rule out uh, br uh, cancer or at least screen for it. Um, so if a PSA level comes back as, high, as higher than 10, they're at a 50% risk for prostate cancer. Doesn't mean they necessarily have prostate cancer, but it means that additional testing should be done. Remember that many things can elevate a PSA level in a male. Things like BPH, ejaculation, riding a bike, a digital rectal exam, sex within the last 24 hours, and certain medications. So take that number with a grain of salt and recognize that additional screening would need to be done if the PSA comes back high. Um, there is some recommendations for routine screening starting at age 50. And if the patient is at higher risk, for example, if they're African American male, or they have a first degree relative, like a brother or a father with prostate cancer, they should begin those screenings at age 45. Colorectal cancer is another very common type of cancer, cancer in the colon or in the rectum. Screening starts from age 45 and goes to age 75, and screening can be done through an annual stool sample for someone who has an average risk, um, which would need to be done every year, or having a colonoscopy done every 10 years. So T in, in primary, secondary, tertiary um, prevention, T stands for treatment. So for patients who already are diagnosed with cancer, the goal is to reduce morbidity and mortality and, and treat them to hopefully re remove the cancer altogether, and if not, to slow the progression and in make sure that there's a high quality of life. And ways we accomplish that are through things like chemo and radiation and also some surgeries. There are a number of ways that cancer can be diagnosed and it really depends on where the cancer is. So some laboratory tests like uh, CBC, uh, PSA can detect cancer. Certainly imaging tests like CAT scans and MRIs um, and, and, and scopes can diagnose cancer. If there is some sort of solid tumor, a biopsy will be often taken where a small sample of the tumor tissue itself is sent to the lab, put under a microscope to determine if those are mutated cancer cells. Um, and then again, some endostic, endoscopic procedures where a scope is done either through a colonoscopy, a cystoscopy, an EGD to visualize um, the area of the GI tract or the urinary tract um, and to take samples for the lab. Here's an example of a needle biopsy. Um, the female patient would be brought into the uh, same day surgery kind of procedure area. Um, there is some local anesthesia and usually like a local sedative uh, that's done to keep the patient calm and um, a small amount of the tumor cells are aspirated through a needle and then that is sent to the lab. This would happen if like a female had a positive mammogram finding and the next step would be to confirm that with a biopsy because not all abnormal mammograms are going to be cancer. Here's an example of a scope. So this is a bronchoscopy where the scope could be done right into the lungs um, to visualize any cancers and also to take uh, samples again of any tissue. Surgical treatment is sometimes indicated. It just depends on the kind of cancer we're talking about. They can take out a tumor. They can debulk a tumor. Um, so for example, if a tumor is just causing a lot of pain or the pa patient is unable to move around very well, or it's causing things like a urinary obstruction. Sometimes uh, surgery is curative and sometimes it's just to help improve function. Radiation can also be done. Uh, radiation can be done externally, internally, or systemically to kill off cancer cells. When managing a patient who is undergoing radiation treatment, whether external or internal, uh, it's important that we're considering our own safety. And so as we think about radiation, there's three nursing considerations, time, distance, and shielding. How long are you with the patient? That's the time consideration the distance from the patient, how close are you in proximity? Are you six feet away? Or are you right next to the patient? And shielding, are you wearing a lead apron and preventing the radiation that way? So the more time, the more distance, and the more shielding, the more protected you are um, from that radiation. So let's talk about some specifics with radiation. So brachytherapy is an internal radiation where a small amount of radioactive um, substance is inserted basically in a capsule directly into the area where they're trying to kill off cancer cells. 
Um, and so this patient has radiation in their body. Uh, it's called brachytherapy. And a couple things you wanna do to increase time, distance, and shielding is to make sure that the patient's door is closed at the hospital and that there's a warning sign on the door. They should avoid having visitors who are with them longer than 30 minutes. And those visitors need to be more than six feet from the patient. Again, time and distance. And when you as the nurse goes into the room, um, you should wear a lead apron, that's the shielding component. Wear a dosimeter, which talks about how much radiation exposure you're getting, so it keeps track of that. And make sure you're facing the patient so that you are protected by the lead apron that you're wearing. Sometimes patients go through external radiation where they'll go up to basically looking kind of like an x-ray machine and radiation is infused through their, through their skin um, for a, a certain amount of time in this treatment. Um, if external radiation is done, there's going to be markings on their skin of where they're going to have this radiation done. Make sure that the patient doesn't mark, wash off those marks. Those are important for the therapy. Uh, the patient's skin can become kind of irritated from this, so we want to avoid um, lotions or powders, avoid soap and water, unless anything, uh, unless there's some kind of prescribed lotion. And then, of course, because the skin kind of gets burned, um, they, you don't want to have any extra heat on the area of the radiation. So no sun or skin expo sun or heat exposure on the radiated skin. So in addition to radiation, we also have chemotherapy um, and other medications that can help reduce these cancers or hopefully cure them. Um, immunologic therapies actually deal directly with the immune system of the body to help suppress these mutated cells. And then of course, bone marrow transplants are also an option for some types of cancer. For now, I wanna talk specifically about chemotherapy and then a couple of complications that can come up because of chemotherapy. So if a chemotherapy is being done, um, the nurse is going to have specialized training and certification in administering chemotherapy. So you graduating with your RN license are not uh, qualified to administer chemo. That's a specialized training that you receive as a nurse. So these chemotherapy specialized nurses are going to use special PPE, gowns and gloves, um, they're going to double bag linens in the room and encourage the patient to double flush their toilets and use a, flash, a splash guard because that chemo can still be active like in their urine. And so we don't want the chemotherapy um, agents to be in, um, invading healthy people. These should be just for the patient who needs the treatment. Because remember, sometimes the treatment itself can cause significant uh, damage to the patient as it's trying to win the war against the cancer. So if you think about it, chemotherapy is trying to kill off cells, but those cells are our own body's cells. They are just mutated versions of our own body. So chemotherapy is really aggressive and can be harmful to the patient because while it kills off cancer cells, it also kills off a lot of healthy cells. And so patients may not feel very sick before they start chemotherapy and then may feel pretty awful with the chemo, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, uh, the list goes on. Hair loss, of course, as well. So some of the complications of chemotherapy include neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia, malnutrition, mucositis, and central line infections. Let's talk about those now. Neutropenia means that there is a low white blood cell count. So if someone has a low white blood cell count because the chemo has killed off the white blood cells, they're at a higher risk for infection. So if you've got a cancer patient on chemo coming in to the hospital with a fever, that's a really bad sign because they have their body's immune system has been wiped out by the chemotherapy and they don't have the ability to fight off infections. Patients who have neutropenia, who have a low white blood cell count, need to be on neutropenic precautions things to prevent them from getting infections. So they should not have any live plants or flowers. They are, should have all of their vegetables and fruits cooked to prevent any foodborne illnesses. So no fresh fruits and vegetables, no sick visitors. And when they're at home, they need to be encouraged to avoid sick people and avoid crowds. Report a fever of 100 um, or greater. They should not do any yard work or um, handle cat litter. 
and they should be disinfecting their toothbrush daily. Again, they're at high risk for getting infection because we've wiped out their white blood cell counts with chemotherapy. So we wanna prevent infections from coming. The second complication of chemotherapy is anemia. Anemia means a low red blood cell count. And the most common uh, uh, sign and symptom of that is fatigue. The treatment for that is typically ferrous sulfate, that's just iron supplements, um, epigen, which um, can help increase red blood cells. But remember, if you're giving epigen to avoid, uh, it's a sub-Q injection, we want to avoid rubbing the injection site. And we're going to monitor for um, their blood pressure as well as their risk for blood clots. So monitoring for things like signs and symptoms of heart attacks, strokes, DVTs, and PEs, clots in their lungs. Patients with anemia should be encouraged to ingest iron-rich foods, rich foods in uh, folate and B1. Um, and then they should also, sorry, that should say B12. Um, and then they should also increase their rest because they're going to be easy, more easily fatigued. The next complication of cancer is thrombocytopenia, low platelets. Now platelets clump up and um, and stop us from bleeding. So when we have thrombocytopenia, we're at high risk for bleeding. So we're gonna watch for bleeding with these patients. We're gonna watch for blood in the urine, in the stool, and in their vomit. We're going to avoid IVs and IV injection uh, and IM injections. And if we have to put an IV in, or if we have to put an, do an IM injection, we're gonna have to hold pressure on that area for about two minutes because they're not gonna clot as fast as someone who had normal platelets. Uh, the patient uh, should be encouraged to use an electric razor and not a regular razor because this electric razor decreases the risk for getting cut. Patients should not be on NSAIDs. They should be encouraged to blow their nose softly so they don't uh, start having a significant bloody nose. Um, we should encourage them to avoid falls and so think about safety risks because they'd be at risk for internal bleeding. Um, and patients may be on um, platelet stimulating drugs, drugs sub-Q. Um, typically, uh, this drug here is called Nulasta, and it's often given uh, sub-Q 24 hours after chemo to try to boost the red blood cells. The next complication of, of uh, chemotherapy is malnutrition. Uh, chemotherapy causes a significant amount of nausea and vomiting, as well as anorexia. And so um, the way we manage that is to give an antiemetic, um, like Zofran, 30 minutes before chemo. Um, we can use appetite stimulants to try to encourage patients to eat. Uh, tell them not to drink liquids with their meals because liquids fill us up and we want them to get as many calorie dense foods as they can at their meals. Um, and we can also consider vitamin supplements as well as um, supplement drinks like Ensure or Boost. Another complication of chemotherapy is mucositis. Mucositis means that the mucous membranes, the inside of the mouth and tongue, can become inflamed or ulcerated with wounds. Um, this can cause significant amount of pain and good oral care is needed. So the patient should rinse their mouth twice a day with saline. They should use soft toothbrushes or mouth sponges, nothing harsh that could um, further irritate those ulcers. Um, they should avoid any harsh mouthwashes like glycerin or alcohol-based mouthwashes, and they should avoid sharp-edged food like potato chips and crackers that could irritate and cut into those mouth ulcers. Finally, let's talk about some oncologic emergencies related to cancer. So patients who have cancer are in, on, and are on treatment for cancer are a risk for some emergencies that we would need to be able to recognize. The first one is tumor lysis syndrome. Tumor lysis syndrome is when those cancer cells die off so quickly that they release their toxins into the blood. It's common mostly with hematologic cancers like leukemia. And the signs and symptoms we're gonna notice are electrolyte imbalances like hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, acidosis, an increased heart rate, uh, sorry, heart irregularities, and an increased respiratory rate. So if you've got a patient coming in with these types of symptoms and they're on, on cancer treatment, you wanna think about tumor lysis syndrome. The treatment for tumor lysis syndrome is IV fluids and diuretics, um, allopurinol, and manage their electrolytes. 
We're going to want to check for hypocalcemia. We'll notice things like paresthesias or numbness if they're hypocalcemic. And we're going to want to watch their kidney function, specifically BUN, creatinine, and their urine output. The second uh, oncologic emergency is spinal cord compression. Spinal cord compression happens when there is a tumor on the spinal cord that physically compresses the spinal cord, cutting off circulation and communication from that point in the spine down. So initially, the patient may complain of some um, pain or numbness and tingling, but then as that compression worsens, um, they can have physical weakness where they're not able to move as well. Um, and then the latest sign is autonomic dysfunction. Autonomic dysfunction happens when there's a problem with the nervous system and it's no longer able to control involuntary functions of the body. Some of those involuntary functions of the body can be things like urinary problems, like incontinence, sweating abnormalities, the inability to maintain thermoregulation, um, the inability to regulate your heart rate. So if you're exercising, um, you can't get your heart rate to, to compensate for that, it won't raise. Um, sexual dysfunctions, problem with digestion, um, and the inability to recognize low blood sugars. So the warning signs, like those hypoglycemia signs, they're just not there. And so someone could be hypoglycemic and not know it. So since this is a compression issue, the treatment for spinal cord compression is to somehow remove the compression off of the spinal cord. And that can be done through surgery, it can be done through steroids, or even radiation. And it's our job as nurses to assess for things like um, problems with the central nervous system, back pain, weakness, numbness, tingling, an unsteady gait, or the loss of the ability to distinguish between hot and cold. We can also look for things like constipation or incontinence. Hypercalcemia is another complication, an oncologic emergency from uh, cancer treatment. Uh, it's common when there are tumors that have metastasized to the bone because bones are full of calcium. And so as the bone breaks down, that extra calcium is released into the bloodstream causing hypercalcemia. So signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia include somnolence, delirium, muscle weakness, constipation, polyuria, and bradycardia. Treatment for hypercalcemia is IV fluids and phosphorus because there's an inverse relationship between phosphorus and calcium. So if we increase phosphorus in the body, the calcium levels are gonna go down. It's our job to uh, monitor for signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia, provide hydration, and we should anticipate this as a problem if the patient has metastasized to the bone. If we know that there's bone involvement, we know that the patient's at high risk for this. Finally, as a reminder, cancer patients are going to enter our care at all different areas. Pa cancer patients can break a bone and end up in the trauma unit because they have a broken bone. They can end up in the clinic for a flu shot. They can end up in the emergency room with tumor lysis syndrome. And so we need to anticipate that patients may come in presenting with cancer symptoms and be there for their cancer treatment, but they can also be cancer patients who happen to be there for another reason. So as nurses, in all areas and subspecialties of med surge, we're going to see cancer patients and we need to be prepared for that. And that's going to wrap it up for our general overview of cancer care. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.